Welcome back to Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age. Last time we got ourselves another Esper, though I'm not actually licensed for it yet. I need a little bit more LP on Vaan, which I, uh, I think I'll probably get in the meantime. This time, I kind of want to start things by going for a different optional Esper. This one is in the Mosferen High Waste, and the earliest it can be done is right after you help the Moogles in the Salika Wood open the door to the Fon Coast. After that, and I, yeah, this music is great, um, glad this is back, um, yeah, in fact, the Crafts Moogles are back. So, the Shrines are actually working now, they have water in them. What is your theory? So, you can create steam which makes the floatweed rise like balloons. The floatweed actually creates platforms for you to um, access different areas of the moss for a high waste, as this guy's probably going to explain here. Okay, so this place is actually called Mosfera. Windblown Worm God Path. So, yeah, our goal here is to get to the summit. And for that, we need to activate certain specific shrines. Okay, Shrine of the South Wind. This is the one we need to activate first. I should also mention that you do actually need some Gishal Greens in order to fully complete this. So yeah, the float weed's going up there. And this caused an exclamation mark to appear on the map, showing where that float weed went. Okay, so around here there's a wild chocobo, which you will need to use, um... Gisal, not Gisal, I keep thinking there's an H in there. Uh, Gisal Greens to ride. And while riding this, we'll be able to cross over um, that path with the exclamation mark. So this area right here is actually where uh, a rare game that's not even a trophy rare game for the Hunt Club quest spawns that I couldn't get to before simply because we just couldn't access this part of the map without the shrines. So the reason why we needed the chocobo is because we need one to cross through this grass. This is a chocobo only path. And that leads us out here. It's a little annoying that you can't pick up chests with a chocobo though. So, like, if we go around here, you might notice that this is where the summit is. However, we can't get past here just yet. We need a few more um, batches of float weed. But over here, though, we do have a path that leads us back into the center. However, I think this will force us to dismount the chocobo. I guess you can't bring wild feral chocobos into civilized areas with shops in them. But now that we're here, there should be another shrine as well as a rock that we can cut down to uh, access this place anywhere we want. That would be this rock right here, I think. <laughs> I was wondering, like, how you knock down rocks like this without your weapons when you're in, like, a town screen, but <laughs> Vaughn just lightly taps it. So yeah, we now have a path over here, but more importantly, we can activate this shrine. I suppose all the other shrines would do is just create shortcuts uh, to and from other parts of the high waste. Because yeah, there's one um, bit of float weed there, and now we need to activate the shrine of the west wind. And now I think we need to activate this one? I like the, the concept of float weed, it's, it's kind of a cool idea. And yes, there's now two patches of float weed there. That should let us reach the Empyrean Seat. Before that, 
you should probably save. Back in this area with no chocobo this time, we'll be able to cross up here. This, I think, was actually one of the first optional espers that I discovered in my first playthrough. Oh, I was thinking that, that you'd get one shot by that Blizzaga, but, um, just barely did not. Because overall, this isn't a particularly difficult puzzle to figure out, and it's one that's definitely very much uh, accessible to a lot of players. Whether or not this fight is accessible to a lot of players in terms of difficulty, well, we'll see. Now the third one comes out to play. Let's just quickly deal with this. Yeah, neither of you can hit flying enemies, but that's not really going to be that important where we're going. This Esper is not officially a flyer, I think it only is considered hovering. Because it does float above the ground a little bit. Reflect Gun Motes. Uh, I don't know how useful that's going to be here, actually. Speaking of which, to basically spoil the gimmick of this fight, you can't use items in this battle. So it's very important that you set people's gambits to using spells like Rays instead of Phoenix Downs. In fact, because of that, you definitely want a lot of good magic users in this party. It's way easier in the uh, vanilla PS2 version because everybody has access to Rays. Also, the gambits like this, foe status equals reflect dispel. Be careful of that. This guy likes to use Reflect, however, later in the fight, he's coded to counter dispelling his Reflect with non-elemental magic. And very powerful non-elemental magic at that, so you might actually want to leave his Reflect up, and instead focus on um, giving your magic damage dealers um, things like the, um, the Opal Ring. However, this guy can also inflict things like Stop on you, and without... Um, yeah, without items to cure that, you might want stop immunity on your uh, Esuna casters. Okay, power armlet requires accessories 18. And that's going to prevent Ash from using the opal ring. Hang on a second, that's... Is that a... Is that a... That, that must be a rare game. Okay, Penelo's raising. Now she needs to dispel. And it's weak to water, so I'm using the Aqua Shot on Balthia right now. I can also petrify you. I'm gonna have to go back to the save point after this and hope this thing doesn't, um doesn't respawn. Using the trident on Barge to hit flyers, obviously. This thing's level is like in the low 50s, so about the level of the Esper that I was trying to fight here. Guess it's a bit of a test to see how quickly I can get my uh, curing gambits off. Almost down. There we go. Okay, yeah, so that was a trophy rare game for the Hunt Club. So that explains why I, I didn't see that thing before. Okay, I'm buffed, and I'm just trying to decide whether I attempt to... I want to try and berserk somebody, but I'm not sure whether it should be Barsh or Balthier, because Barsh actually has status curing, which could help me in a pinch. This sounds kind of weird and uncivilized by his standards, but I might actually kind of want to Berserk Ball Fear. Oh, uh, Barsh isn't fully healed yet. Oh, and somebody's haste wore off. Okay, let's finally move out.
no items? Yep, this guy is a competitive Smash Bros player. This is Exodus the Judge Soul, and I'm gonna get rid of his starting buffs, because I think that's okay. He's not gonna counter until a bit later in the fight. And we can't use um, Bacchus' wine to um, berserk ourselves for this. And he does 50% resist all elements, so I might as well equip a um, non-elemental sword. Also, crystal shields are very effective for this, since they are some of the few shields at this point that give magic evade. Yep, there's Reflect going off. I've actually turned off most of Canelo's um, like offensive magic spells, namely Drain, just because I want her to be saving her MP for curing status and reviving, because we won't be able to use items for that, obviously. Uh, also, our oh, Balthira's shell, I specifically didn't shell Bash just to increase the chances of berserking him. Ugh, you know what? I'm gonna try berserking Bash for this. So Exodus is primarily a, a specialist in non-elemental magic. Uh, namely things like Flare, Scathe, Scourge are uh, those spells. They do heavy damage, but they also have very slow animations, which in your hands makes them not entirely optimal in a lot of circumstances. Okay, Unleash, I think, just um, makes all of his magic cost 0 MP, which doesn't really matter since, like, the chances of enemies running out of MP is really low to begin with. However, Scathe? Scathe is a problem. I'm going to preemptively have you set up a Cura just uh, so hopefully this goes off. As that happens... Okay, then, yeah, Scathe is super powerful, and from this point on, I think he's going to counter with that whenever, um... Uh, whenever... Berserker's doing quite a number on him, actually. Whenever, um... Uh, we dispel his Reflect. So, usually, unless you have, um, of course, that accessory, that, um... Oh, great. Fran... Fran... Just killed us, didn't she? Yeah, you know what? Actually, no Fran, yes Varn. Oh, hey, that actually cancels the spell outright. That's good to know. If you've got somebody who um, is about to smack or reflect with their magic, you can take them out of the party and they will stop casting magic, even if the action meter's already full. Uh, okay, Ash, I just want to make sure she doesn't have the, the thing. I'll give her that just in case she decides to go ham with magic on this thing. Like that. Oh yeah, and he's become immune to physical damage, dang it. Um... Uh... And he's about to use Flare. Okay, this, I could be horribly, horribly wrong about this, but... Yeah, Bash, oh, Bash can't participate in Quickenings because he's Berserk. And I can't take him out of the party because he's, um, uh, getting targeted. Hmm. Uh, I don't think Quickening's count as physical is the thing. So the moment that Barsh stops getting blown up... Huh, Barsh just straight up blocked Flare? That's kind of interesting. Uh, okay, he's going for Ash now and I can officially take you out. So I can put Fran back before she starts being an idiot with Darker. I am pretty sure Quickenings are not considered physical or magical, so this should get through his paling. Great, I never had Arc Blast before, so I think the only one I'm missing is the Holy One now. That's two of every, every of everything, I think. Yeah. Oh, wow, he actually does take no damage from that. Also, yeah, if you look closely here, you can see that he's actually a tree. Um, so... I guess I have to... Unfortunately, I have to... Well, firstly, I have to take Fran out of the party. Uh, but unfortunately, I have to... I mean, Barsh can still... Or, you know, I can just, um, turn off Fran's magic gambits, which is almost everything she has right now. 
Because, yeah, at this point, um, if you can't, um... Uh, pierce his reflect, he's basically invincible. <laughs> oh, great, Scathe. Uh, yeah, Scathe is, um, extremely painful, but he's down. So, yeah, Exodus is based off of, um, X-Death, the big bad of Final Fantasy V. Otherwise known as the extremely hammy tree who's obsessed with the Void. And voiced by the same voice actor as M. Bison from Street Fighter. And also, um, one of the major characters in Trails of Cold Steel. That guy's got a great, deep, booming voice. He, uh, he was just perfect for X-Death. <laughs> X-Death is kind of hilarious in City of Final Fantasy. FF5 in general is kind of... It's a game I might want to check out sometime, because it's, um... One day I kind of want to try a blind four-job fiesta. Don't know if I'd actually record it or not, but... Yeah, because, like, at a time when a lot of RPGs were very dark and angsty, FF5 is extremely light-hearted and basically almost a self-parody of the series. And at the time, that wasn't received well, but it's much better received now. Uh, it was also the game where Gilgamesh originated from. And I was expecting Penelo... Actually, no, Penelo did contribute a lot to that fight because um, of Berserk Barsh, which just... Holy crap, Barsh was doing a lot of damage while Berserk. Yeah, this guy takes quite a bit from, um, from Berserk attackers, and it's for that reason that I kind of... Okay, so that was a lot easier than I expected it to be. Like, a lot easier than I expected it to be. That's kind of the thing with Espers, it's why I don't want to leave them for too late, because if you leave them too late, they actually get much easier. They range from absurdly difficult when you're underleveled to actually very easy if you're at the right level. So I actually feel taking them on a little bit underleveled is, um, is like, at least the most fun for me, personally. Because I think, uh, Exodus is more intended to be fought, like, before you reach Arcades, because he was way easier than I expected. And yes, Exodus uh, represents the star sign of Libra, so he's actually the one that corresponds to my star sign. He, he is actually kind of cool. The non-elemental gimmick is interesting, and it works on pretty much every enemy. But now I need to check to see what kind of licenses he unlocks. So Exodus for Shikari gets you Stamp. Gives you more HP for Bushi. Oh, okay, Decoy and Oil for Mechanist. That's not a bad idea. And for Knight, increased HP. For Red Battle Mage, some heavy armor. Don't really know if that's the best idea, since it doesn't boost magic. Ulan gets nothing, okay. Barsh has too many espers anyway, so I'm kind of glad for that. And White Mage gets Battle Law, really. And Time Battle Mage gets... Battle Law. So overall, I don't... Does Bolfi have any espers right now? I don't think he has any espers. Because overall, I'm starting to think that Bolfia might be the best choice. Because at least that gives him access to um, some utility green magic. Though it should be noted that whoever gives Knight access to these spells, I wanted to give Bolfia later. Unfortunately, that means there's... Uh, well, there's one Esper that I can't demo yet, but I can actually get you... Oh, we have something new in the Sky Pirates den. Gabrant. <laughs> okay, looks like it's some strange creature wearing Gabrant's helmet. <laughs> oh, I actually. Oh, I must have got the Holy One earlier. So yeah, I have all the concurrences. That's actually kind of a rare um, Sky Pirates den thing to get, Mist Walker, because of the sort of guide dang it requirements of all of them. So where did I get the Holy One? I must have yeah got that somewhere and not realized. Because, yeah, I've got all of them now. That's that's great. I wasn't even thinking I'd get that one on camera. But what I was actually in the clan primer to check was antline infestation. Okay, so you, you are in Bujeba. Because that was actually pretty fast. I didn't expect that fight to take that quick. Oh, right, this is the one that I'm going to feel really bad for putting off, because, um... 
your children are lost in the mines and there's a giant carnivorous praying mantis on the loose in there. So the paling collapsing I think is an explanation for why you can head further in the mines now than you could before. And there's a reason there was a paling there. That's because the second half of the Lusu Mines has much, much more dangerous enemies, and that key she's mentioning? This is a very important hunt for a few reasons. Well, actually, namely one reason. The reason is that you get the key out of this hunt, and that key lets you explore the second half of the Lusu Mines. And by access to the second half of the Lushu Mines, you get two things. One, some extremely good equipment. There is some, in, especially in Zodiac, but even in the original. I remember in, um, in vanilla, um, um, Site 3 keys, by the way, not, not the key that I'm referring to. I think it's called Site 11 key. That's the one that gets you even further. That requires you to complete the antlion hunt. But, um, even in vanilla, I remember quite clearly that you could get what was in the PS2 version, the best gun in the game, um, pretty much guaranteed um, in that part of the Lusu Mines. I remember getting that and having that on Bolfia all the way up until the end. That's not the case anymore, however, there are some fixed chests in Zodiac that contain some really, really good weapons and armor in there. And I'm in the wrong place. And that's actually what I'm here to do. I want to fight the antlion. Who, if I check here, is... Yep, he's all the way down there. And that isn't even the uh, deepest and worst part of the Lusu Mines, by the way. But if I do successfully get the key, I want to try and sneak through the very, very dangerous part of the Lusu Mines to try and pick up some of these extremely good equipments. 